David Premack described this, and I think it was autobiographical. A man had gone to pick up his children at the library. Thunderstorm greeted him as he arrived there, and as he waited with his engine running, he searched his pockets, and there was a familiar problem, no cigarettes. Not in the glove compartment, not under the seat, not in his pockets, nowhere in the car. So he pulled away from the curb quickly to go buy a pack of cigarettes at the corner store. And he never smoked again. What happened? Fully dependent smoker. What caused him to quit? Glancing back at the library, he caught a glimpse of his children stepping out into the rain, but he continued around the corner, certain he could find a parking space, rush in, buy the cigarettes, and be back before the children got seriously wet. And he said, dear heaven, I'm a father who would leave his children standing in the rain to chase a drug. No. That was it. That was it. Now, it's a behavior, smoking. That, that's a kind of dramatic example of the kind of thing we see in motivational interviewing. It, it, he wasn't, it, he wasn't uh, getting behavior therapy for his smoking. I mean, not, nothing like that happened. It was a moment of insight, in a way, or shame, or however you want to describe it. The behavior of smoking was inconsistent with something that was much more important to him. What was that underlying event? A decision? Well, kind of. He decided not to smoke. A shift in perception? Yeah, smoking had a whole new meaning for him all of a sudden. People talk about the difference between being a smoker who has quit and being a non-smoker. The latter is a different kind of identity. Certainly an emotional impact to it. Increased readiness to take a look at change? Yep, that's going on. Ambivalence getting resolved? Yep. What smoker isn't ambivalent about smoking? You know? um, but here suddenly it shifts. Some write about the, uh, the Baumeister writes about the crystallization of discontent, that this was sort of the last straw that, that caused the balance to tip. You know? The best thing I can find that makes sense of this to me is Milton Rokic's theory of personality. That there, there are various levels to our experience. At the most peripheral, there are behaviors or feelings or thoughts in the moment. Right? And beneath those are a set of things we believe about the world. And beneath those, he said, are attitudes that we have about who we are and what the world is like. And beneath those, values, instrumental values about how to do things. And beneath those, Terminal values, the things that you want to accomplish in your life. You know? Instrumental, the way you do it. Terminal, what you actually want and care about and desire in your life. And then a sort of mysterious self in the middle. He said, when something that's more peripheral comes in the conflict with something deeper, change happens. If it's a behavior that comes into conflict with something dear, which is what happened in the pre-MAC example, the behavior loses. But if you get conflict at the deepest level, it can spread out through the entire system. You know? When I read that, I thought, this is, in a way, this is what we're seeing in quantum change. And if it is some sort of underlying change that triggers, uh, underlying shift that triggers change, it's not just that we're selectively reinforcing change talk in motivational interviewing. We know that matters, but there's something much more important going on that we don't understand as well so far.